I'm excited for our next presentation. Uh, Aaron came uh, all the way from Chicago to help us learn about technology. <laughs> Aaron is a caffeine-powered server fox over at DNS Simple, and his presentation is going to be really cool. Please welcome Aaron. Remember that VGA adapter story? We're working on it still. Right. There you go, Aaron. Cool. Hello. Yay, technology. Who loves technology? I love technology. There we go. Uh, let's see here. Let me get my presenter notes. Cool. All right. Uh, technology's hard. I, I try to make it work every day. It's and DNS, right? Because it's always DNS. There we go. Ah, sweet. I also love this opening slide. I wasn't sure how well it would translate. Oh, cool. All right, it does look cool. I, I searched high and low for like really cool random images on the internet, and it takes you to some really dark corners of the internet sometimes too, so beware. But um, yeah, searching for chefs and everything, um, you find all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> um, turn on safe search. <laughs> That's a pro tip. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, as you int uh, introduced me, I'm Caffeine Powered Server Fox. So yes, I do have a foxtail. No one spiked your coffee that I know of. Um, you know, and I am in. This is like the second time I've given a talk in a church. I don't know if that's like a trend or something. Not sure if that's a thing. Uh, but I do love this venue, and I really want to thank uh, the organizers for being super welcoming to me. This is my first time in Ohio. In Ohio. Like, I've driven through here, but I've never actually stopped anywhere. Uh, so being my first time in Columbus, it's been really cool. I went to like a cool Greasy Spoon Diner this morning, got like an awesome steak and eggs, which is kind of my like benchmark of good diners. And it was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so I'm super excited to be here and to talk, and I'm also really excited to see the sketch notes that will be coming out of my talk. I always know, want to know what the highlights are, what people take away. Um, but as you mentioned, I work for DN Simple. Um, we are a DNS and domain automation uh, management company. So if you ever want to like set up a domain, like purchase a domain, and also just make sure it works on the internet, um, set up your DNS records, and also secure it with SSL certificates, we are the company you should talk to. Uh, we're already built into tools that you might already be using, like Terraform. We were there from day one because we have an open API uh, that we fully support. So if you use Go, Ruby, Elixir, uh, even Python, it's not an official library from us, but we still help support it as much as we can. So if you just want to set up domains and everything, or like build up a mail cluster in, say, Terraform and have it automatically create its MX records, you can do that. It's really easy. Um, so if you want to know more about that, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, oh, why? All right. Technology again. My keynote thing just died. So let's just go manual here. All right, so to introduce myself for those uh, who don't know me, my name is Aaron Kalin. Um, and yes, I generally have red hair. So as you see there, um, it's on my driver's license. It's on my passport now, too, which makes border control freak out a little bit, because they look at it and they see light brown hair or dark brown hair. Right, OK. And they freak out a little bit, because they see all the red hair. Um, I just love it. You could say it's my favorite color. Um, and I, my preferred pronouns are he and him, if we are going to chat later. Um, and you might also see this if you check out my Twitter feed. It is, my handle is at martinisoft. I'm going to put it on every slide. So if you want to tweet about uh, my talk, uh, give me some feedback. I'd love to incorporate that to update everything um, in my slides and all that. So that way, we make sure I have the right information that comes across to everyone. Um, so <sighs> let's see here. Oh, there we go. Come on, technology. Uh, so this talk originated for me kind of getting on a soapbox at ChefConf. Um, I was at a sort of community roundtable thing, and at some point, someone brought up the whole idea of like, so how do we, how do we uh, attract and keep talent? Which is like, that's a super basic kind of like pipelining question is what someone you know, might respond with, but um, you know, how, do we, how do we bring in new people into our organization, especially if you want to hire in for like operations or QA or something like that? Um, and that kind of set me off a little bit because I, I've been talking almost for years now about sort of helping increase diversity in technology. Because um, as a very openly queer boy on stage, like if you look at my, my Twitter feed and everything like that, if you look at my profile, I'll say that I'm openly you know, bisexual queer furry, like I've got my you know, foxtail on, all that stuff on stage, I feel kind of lonely up here sometimes um, when I'm chatting with all of you. Because um, even like yesterday, I was actually gonna somewhat point out, like did you notice that it was nothing but a line of dudes uh, proposing talks for the open spaces? Like, I still want to see that change, and so far I'm still not seeing a change in a super meaningful way. It's getting a little bit better, um, but as even Barbara pointed out yesterday, there's still a lot more work to be done. 
Um, so I kind of got on the soapbox and this sort of this ranty thing, and that's where this talk came from. Like, how do we, how do we actually create that talent? Um, but since I come from more of a restaurant background, so like my, my entire family, I'm, I would technically be a third generation uh, restaurateur, because uh, back in 66, my family started a bar and restaurant, and there's been, I think, four or five bars and restaurants in the family in total, so I kind of grew up literally in bars and restaurants. So if I'm unusually comfortable around alcohol, that would be why. <laughs> Especially last night, I was like giving Rob, I think, all, all of the, the different uh, nuances of various gins and things like that and where they come from and all that stuff. Like, I know, again, know far too much about alcohol and probably food as well. Um, so that's why I've also, with this talk, taken uh, puns to an extreme. It's not so much that I'm gonna talk about Chef the Tool, because uh, that also is great because they, they've also taken puns to an extreme, which makes it really, really hard to Google for if you need help, <laughs> right? Like all of their tooling, Chef, Knife. Um, oh, hi, is this that weird one that you, I, I guess, can find? Not really. Um, but so that's why I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with the theme. And uh, today's menu, we're gonna talk about DevOps history. I'm gonna give you a brief history if you don't know about it. Um, I'm gonna draw some parallels to restaurants and the restaurant industry that I think the DevOps community could learn from. Um, and then also I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of uh, close out with a lot of questions. Um, so just so you know, at the end of this talk, there won't be a Q&A section. Um, I'm gonna actually go right into potentially a new opportunity for a new speaker to come up here and, uh, and like deliver a talk with me. Um, but if you wanna ask questions and all that stuff, that is what Open Spaces is for. Um, if you have like really, Big burning questions, you're welcome to come ask, ask me. Uh, I'm easy to spot. I'm one of the, the few colored hair folks here. Um, so let's dive right into it. Let's go into some DevOps history. So who knows uh, what DevOps is, or at least when the uh, phrase was first coined and like knows what the phrase is. Can you see a show of hands? There's like three or four of you raising. Oh, wow, cool, interesting. So uh, DevOps, the term, was first coined back in 2008 by Andrew Schaefer and uh, Patrick Dubois. Um, they were, I believe, at Velocity. Uh, and might be a little fuzzy in that part of the history. I really should have uh, remembered that one. Um, but so they, they originally uh, coined this as kind of a, a way to break down the sort of silos at companies. Like there was you know, the development department, there was the QA department, there were the operations folks. And generally, there were walls between all of them. You know, they would throw stuff over the wall, there'd be managers kind of keeping an eye on them. But at some point, they were like, hey, we should, we should kind of make a party. We should break those walls down, we should bring everyone together, because if we come together, we can not only get more efficiency, better deliverability, we can automate these things. We can, we can really, like, as a group, collaborate. Um, some people will actually take this as a job title, and I think that's okay, personally. Like, if you call yourself a DevOps, that's cool, as long as you're uh, there, personally, I think, as long as you're there to kind of foster that culture in your company. Like, if you are given sort of blessed power by your, your C-level execs to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, managers aren't creating those walls again between teams and all that stuff, if you're there to kind of always Hulk smash those walls and make sure that there's always a party in the middle with all of your different departments, um, then you can make some really cool stuff happen a lot faster than you, tr you know, traditionally just can't at companies. Even the previous talk, talking about how DevOps like increase their pipeline speed and allow them to deliver their product to customers faster, right? And then, you know, in 2009, so right after they sort of first coined that term in an open space, that's where we started getting the first DevOps days. So you were all here by way of them. That's where, that's where the DevOps days sort of thing came from. So I'm gonna go wind the clock a little bit farther back because despite my appearance, I'm actually 32 years old. Uh, so I remember back in the, the heady days in the 90s, um, when we had really crazy like IT departments, because I, want, I like to call the 90s sort of the industrial age of technology. It was when all the companies knew, like, we need a technology. We don't really know what we need, but here's money. Just throw money at the problem, it'll be fine. And companies like CDW were all too happy to be like, oh, you got a budget? We've got stuff to sell you, <laughs> right? We've got entire racks of servers. And back then we had the, those wonderful people that, uh, if you don't know what BOFH, BOFH stands for, it means Bastard Operator from Hell. <laughs> so you, ha you had that, that sort of Milton-type character, if, you, if you're an Office Space fan, who was always in the corner, and they, you know, they would know all of your systems. They might be a COBOL programmer, not to slag those folks, but uh, you know, they might be that person that really, really knows your systems in and out, but they're also not really friendly because they deal with lots of you know, 
stupid things every day, and like people might be badgering them because there's not many answers coming out. So they get really gritty and really unhappy, and so they'll make you suffer for even asking the, the, the most basic, even dumb questions, right? Um, and those people in a DevOps world should just not exist. If you, if you are thinking like, oh yeah, there's that, there's that guy over in my company that kind of behaves that way. They're sort of like, they make me feel terrible every time I talk to them. You, you should really not let them exist inside of a sort of DevOps environment. And if you don't have DevOps in your company, you should definitely bring that there. Um, that culture would not allow someone like that to exist because whether they like it or not, they have to collaborate in order to deliver a good experience to your customers. Um, same goes for like traditional IT. Like back then, again, you know, companies like CDW being like, hey, you need a technology, we can sell you a technology. Let racks and racks of technology. Um, but companies really didn't know what to do with it. You know, they, they had traditional IT to like manage your mail servers, your file system servers, all that stuff. And even back then too, this is my most favorite poetic slide. Who, who relates to this slide? This slide is a little too real for me sometimes. Yeah, yeah, pour one out for your homies that, that know this one too well. But even back then, um, you know, s folks would identify as sort of like, I'm an information technologist, or uh, does anyone here identify as like a sysadmin? Yeah? Operations, right? Like some will say traditional sysadmin. I mean, today you might call yourself a site reliability engineer. To me, it's a very, very similar job. Um, we all kind of wear roughly the same hats. It's just a newer paradigm that we're, uh, we're shifting into today. So now that I've kind of covered a little bit of the history, just a brief background, let me draw some parallels to restaurants because at least for me growing up in the restaurant world, restaurants have kind of had DevOps for a while, actually. I want you all to think back to like a really nice experience you had at a, at a restaurant. It could even be like what you would all think is like a fancy restaurant, like one that you pay maybe like $50 a person to go to. There's really nice service, like you walk in, they greet you at the door, they might even know you by name because they, they already had you booked in the reservation system, all that stuff. You're whisked away to a table and they, you get like a multi-course meal, stuff like that. And all of that is happening because of basically restaurant sort of version of DevOps. Um, in, in that restaurant industry, everyone has these shared responsibilities because if no one works together, you will notice really quickly, like your food won't come out right or the wrong order will come out, stuff like that. If, if these different departments in a restaurant don't operate correctly um, and together, then you're just gonna have a really terrible dining experience and you're probably gonna yelp about it or tweet about it and say like how you know, terrible that absolutely was and you'll never go to that restaurant again. So you know, when you walk in, you're greeted by the front of house staff. Usually there's like a maitre d' or something like that. So I'm just gonna talk like more of like a, a super like nice end restaurant because again, they can afford to have this much staff for it. So that's sort of my example here, not like your greasy spoon diner that I was at this morning because it was basically one person who was doing all of these responsibilities, which totally works if you're a low maintenance restaurant, but if you're more of like one that, that deals with hundreds of customers per day, this is something that you really have to, to scale up to. So the front of house people will be the ones that greet you at the door, um, make sure you get to your table correctly, or you'll have a maitre d' that then hands you off to your server, and your server will be the one that will be handling your dining experience. Um, the front of house staff can also include, like, if you're a super fancy restaurant, you'll have a sommelier, which are the ones that deal with wines and wine pairings and stuff like that. Um, they'll be the ones that suggest, like, oh, this meal goes great with this, this uh, version of wine. Uh, you have the back of house staff that coordinate um, the, the kitchen cooking staff with the sort of front of house people. They make sure that your, your dishes come out on time and correctly. You know, was the thing that you ordered at the right temperature? Stuff like that. You also have the cooking staff who actually make the meals. You know, not just the actual chef, because you might be going to a chef's restaurant and you might know the chef that's, that's running the place, um, but there's still an army of people that make that chef work. You know, there's a sous chef that's below them, there's the line cooks that prep everything, the prep cooks, uh, super fancy. You'll have a saucier, the ones who like create sauces just for the chef. Um, it might be tailored to a dish, something like that, or a patissier ones who make uh, the pastries, the delicious stuff that you have at the end of the meal if you're not too stuffed up. <laughs> um, and then you have the cleanup crew because the way you make money at a restaurant is to turn over tables. Like if you can reset a table three or four times a night, you're making bank because you'll probably initially make enough money to stay open if you fill those tables once. If you do it two or three times, you can pay your staff. You can you keep the lights on. You can you know, weather a storm if you know, it's like a week-long process where there's just no one coming into your restaurant. You know, if you don't have those staff to actually take away the plates, like the, the bussers and stuff like that, to bring them back into the kitchen, and you have your, your kitchen cleaning crew, 
You have the ones that also clean the pots and pans for the chefs when they're done making a dish. If they don't work all together really, really well, then again, you're gonna end up having a terrible experience, or at least something will be very off, and especially if you're paying a lot of money for a restaurant, you kind of want that to be an impeccable experience. And if even a few things are off, you're gonna be like, you know, that was good, but I probably wouldn't pay that much again for that experience, right? And to become a manager in a restaurant uh, typically means that you have to go through every station. Um, as a manager of a restaurant, if you want to be a really good manager of a restaurant, you need to go through every single station. You need to be a busser, you need to be you know, a maitre d', you need to also be a server at, at some point. Maybe even help the, uh, the master chef like in the, in the kitchen doing like line, line work and all that stuff. And while they don't seem like the most glamorous jobs, they're very important and they're also part of that whole machine that makes that thing work. And then if you want to become more of a, not necessarily a master chef directly, you go to culinary school. You learn about all the basics that create a dish. You learn about how the, you know, the basics at least work for running a restaurant. So you kind of get like the buffet table of everything you need to know. Like we sort of had this in uh, these developer boot camps type thing. Like you get the, the buffet table of everything it takes to make a piece of technology. Um, but if you were to just run off and create your own restaurant right out of, out of uh, school, you're most likely going to fail because they're not going to give you everything you need to know because experience will still fill in those gaps that they just can't teach you because they live in more of the academic world, not necessarily the real world. Um, and then becoming a, a master chef means you're going to work under a great one. Um, a lot of the, the best chefs in the world have worked under other great chefs. Um, one of the ones in Chicago that I can, I can draw parallels to, um, he runs Alinea, uh, uh, Grant Eckett's, um, worked at the French Laundry. He just showed up one day as a very, very hungry chef and said, hey, I want to learn how to make the best dishes in the world. And he, and he thought, like, okay, I think I'm, I'm okay at my career, but I still have the best dishes ahead of me. Um, and through that, ended up creating what are, is one of the top 10 restaurants in the world. It's the best one in Chicago, but definitely one of the top 10 in the world by many different uh, standards. So if you want to become a great chef, you have to go seek out one and train under them. Almost like uh, Jedi training academies and stuff like that. To be you know, a master, you must first be a Padawan, right? That's me being a little nerdy. Uh, so finally to the last part of the talk, creating the next chefs. How do we create that? I want you all to think, because this part I'm going to also seed a lot of the, hopefully the talks later for open spaces. It's one of my favorite parts about DevOps days. Um, but who are the master chefs in operations? Can you think of a name? If I, if I ask uh, Matt Stratton in Chicago, he'd say Pete Cheslock. That'd be his instant answer. Um, that's also a trump card. If you ever play DevOps against humanity with him and you want a, a trump card, if you got the Pete Cheslock in your hand, you're going to win. So, um, so yeah, so think about that, that master master craftsmen in operations at least, okay? Are they advancing our craft? Are they creating new operations people? Uh, same for the, like, the QA folks in the audience. Do you know anyone who's, who's advancing sort of the, the craft of quality assurance? Why isn't there? We have this sort of in the development world, there's a lot of those people. Like let me go back to this, this diagram again. Because like I live over in sort of the left-hand hemisphere here. I, I oscillate a lot between development and operations. Like I do development work day to day. I do work on the DN Simple app itself. So if I break the site, I'm really sorry. It might be me. <laughs> um, but we we have this whole development pipeline thing kind of working because we have lots of you know dev schools and stuff that are trying to like really gap fill here. But what about operations? What about QA? Um, and if you look a little bit farther out into the ops landscape, where, where I see some next things sort of happening here, is what about the security folks? Like, why aren't they in this party? They, there's, there's another wall right there. And if you don't believe security matters, then how about, well, let's see, statistically speaking, half of you have had your personal data exposed recently. How do you feel about that? Like, do you think that should be a thing at a company? Should that be a thing at your company? And if not, why isn't it? Like, those people are probably there at your company. Why aren't they part of the, th the, the, the entire thing? I know there's the whole notion of DevSecOps, and personally, I still think DevOps can make it work. Yes, it is an unfortunate term in terms of names, but I still think the idea of DevOps should, is a thing that allows them to be part of this, this really big party in the middle. And then there's another group, too, that I think needs to be here, too, big data. Right? I say big data because that's like the bigger buzzword. Uh, it's like, so if anyone has the buzzword bingo card from earlier, uh, I just checked off a box. Um, so those folks are collecting lots and lots and lots of metrics and telemetry data about 
not only your apps and how they perform, but how your customers are using your app. They're going to give you information about what really matters in your pipeline. Because you might think that that one cool feature is great, but then if no one uses it, why did you even bother in the first place? But if you don't even know that they're not using it, then what does it matter at all? Like how, how in the DevOps world could you actually change this if you brought big data into this? If you brought those, those data scientists, basically, that they call them now, uh, to, to look at all of the telemetry information that you're collecting. Because companies are, are collecting terabytes, even petabytes of data. I think Walmart is one of the largest data warehouses in the world. Imagine what you could do with some of that data if you knew more about it and how you can affect supply chains and how much less you can spend because you're not stocking up things that people really don't want to buy, right? And then another question I've got is, why isn't operations work in a a uh, curriculum for learning uh, computer science. Like when you go through computer science, they don't really talk about how the thing that you're learning to build works in the real world. Like they might do it as like a, a few day exercise, but as far as I can tell, no one in computer science really knows how to like actually operate a server, right? Um, same, I'd ask for QA. Why isn't QA work in that as well? Like is anyone here that, that would be a QA person? Did you go to school for it? Probably not. How about operations? Did you go to school for it? Most of you probably got dragged into it of like, hey, can you run the server? And you're like, sure, how do you run a server? Well, you'll find out, <laughs> right? And sometimes it's just like the deep pool of misery that you get soaked into. Um, in the developing world, like development world, I, and, I, and I actually can change the slide based on like where I'm at because there's enough developer schools out there where I can kind of flavor this to your locale. Um, I was really happy about the whole uh, we can code it thing yesterday. Um, Tech Elevator, I guess, is another one here. Uh, Tech Talent South. I, I just did a Google search for like, so just give me like the local uh, developer schools. Now, I did go through each of their curriculums. None of them actually do anything for operations. None of them do anything for QA. Why not? Um, and, if, and if not, if we can't actually teach it, because some people will be like, no, I can't really teach operations. They just have to like feel the pain. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. That's... Then that's more like, you know, so like going back to the Jedi reference, it's more like we're all Sith Lords and we're just going to make everyone feel pain and darkness and anger all the time. That's not cool. Um, no, 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 no. So, and... and and even with these organizations too, like you, and if, and if that really is a thing, like if we can't teach operations, if we can't teach QA, if that's more of a thing where like in-house you teach the person how you do QA yourself or how you do operations yourself, I guess that's fine. But if you're going to pull them in by way of development, then maybe reach out to these schools to hire the people that are being, you know, sort of created through them. You know, and while they will be very new, very young, very potentially hungry because now they know of this entirely new opportunity that they never knew they had until they go through this school. Like, maybe like that can be a new a new avenue for us. Um, would I put a school like maybe ITT Tech here, or DeVry University when that was a thing? Right? Would you trust anyone who would have a, a degree from them? <laughs> Silence befalls the room. I think that, that's my answer. So how do we create more pathways? And again, like I said before, you know, if, if that's a thing of where we have to uh, bring in and mentor uh, more folks that come from those uh, developer schools, maybe that's the way to do it. I'm not sure. Like I'm going to, again, seed all these questions to you because we should just have some open spaces to talk about it. Uh, like how, do we, how do we really bring in those new people? Like actually, just, just curious because I can, you know, maybe some of you are falling asleep. Can I get a, a show of hands? How many of you are currently hiring? Like, you're looking for people right now. That's about, I want to say, 30-ish percent. Oh, whoa, there we go. I can see up top now. There's a stage light on me. All right, so that's about, I want to say, four dozen, maybe. OK, how many of you are going to be hiring potentially in the next six to 12 months? Like, you're not hiring now, but you're probably going to be hiring soon. That's about four or five more? OK. So how do you think you're going to be able to get people for those teams? Do you already have people in the pipeline now? Like, keep, like, raise your hand if you already have people now, like, I'm going to hire someone tomorrow. No? All right. So how can we really fix this? Um, one way is, can you create a mentorship or an apprenticeship? Like, can you actually, can your company pay someone, especially a senior level engineer, someone you would call that, uh, to, to go to like the We Code, Yes We Code and all the We Code camps and all that stuff, to go there and actually mentor a student. Like, wouldn't that be really cool if it basically would sort of be like a, a really awesome internship with someone who is really experienced in the industry, the, 
the senior level uh, person would also get a lot more of an education because they're, they're now learning from basically an entirely new person. They're going to ask questions that they haven't even thought about the answers to maybe five, ten years, you know, if they're that seasoned. So why can't you create those, those types of things at your company? If you already have this at your company, why am I not hearing about it? Like, really, really be vocal about it. Make blog posts. Get up here and speak about it. Because I don't see anything talking about that. I see people talking about, let's create a DevOps culture, which is cool. I think as part of your DevOps culture, that should also include apprenticeships and mentorships. And then the other question, too, because some ask, like, how do we fix the sort of diversity gap? And I'm not talking, and like, when I say diversity, too, that, that comes down to many axes. I know, like, very obviously, we're talking about gender, so bringing more women into this space. We're talking about race, bringing more people of color into the space. Um, but there's also folks who have, like, different skill sets. And I'm, and I'm also saying, like, new apprentices. Like, have you ever thought about into operations? I'm not saying you should give them root right off the bat, <laughs> but. What if you can bring someone who has barely touched the command line and learn them, uh, teach them how to do your job in, say, six to 12 months? Do you think you can do it? If not, I'll throw the challenge down for you, and I would love to hear about it next year. Because I would love to see you come up and share that story about how you taught someone who is brand new to tech, who would never have the opportunities that you had, uh, to like, become part of your organization and actually help foster that DevOps culture. In fact, if you get them hooked on DevOps culture, I'd almost guarantee that they're going to be like, the other loud supporter of you at your company of like, hey, we are going to DevOps. And you're like, what's that? Look, like, well, let me show you. And then they'll all be about it. And then it's not so much like uh, when I talk about the, the uh, diversity gap, too, like I have up here, why aren't you reaching out to those groups, too? Because I hear from others who are like, oh, yeah. We posted you know, a job and everything, and you know, we try to like, filter out our candidates so that the correct way and all that stuff. And then I asked them, like, so have you like, got, uh, talked to Girl Develop It? Or uh, like in Chicago, we have IC Stars, um, which is more of a, uh, an urban youth development program. Like they, they not only teach just developers, they teach like, project managers, all that stuff. Like it's a big tech incubator. Really cool program. Like have you reached out to them to be like, hey, we're looking to hire someone. Can you send us some candidates? And believe me, they will happily send you a lot of people. I know this. We did this. Uh, if you want to know more about it, come talk to me after the talk. So I think I've, I've ranted enough. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Um, so hopefully, I've, I've, the last part of this talk, I've left you with a lot of takeaways, but also like different questions that you can ask and bring up in open spaces. If none of you do, I will put them up. Um, so that way, we can have some more meaningful discussions later today. Um, I would love to thank all of you for the opportunity to speak. And I'm really curious to see what that's going to look like now. So I'm super excited about it. Um, again, thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And thank you all for listening to me. Um, I guess if we have time, uh, we've got a bonus double feature uh, let me see here. So again, let me go ahead and close this out. So thank you very much. All right. Again, technology. There we go. Uh, wait. Yeah, yeah. OK. All right, so this one is kind of an opportunity for someone who has never spoken before to come up here and talk with me. So to give you a little background, this is a fun just dialogue. This is about two and a half minutes, so it's super fast. It'll be over before you know it. Um, the slide deck is already built, so you just have to read off of the presenter screen. So you'll come over here and hang out with me. Um, I guess we need a second mic for this. Um, so you'll come out and hang out with me. Uh, if we don't have a second mic, then we'll get very cozy together. Um, trust me, I'll ask for permission. Um, and it will be about two and a half minutes, really quick. If, especially if you're a programmer, you'll probably giggle and laugh at a lot of these jokes. There's a lot of puns, uh, inside programmer humor. If you're a manager, I'm really sorry, you might be confused. Um, operations folks, you'd be like, really? <laughs> so has, would anyone like to come up here and join me to deliver this talk? It's kind of a bonus double feature. You haven't spoken before? Come on up. Hi there, what's your name? Bruce. Bruce. Everyone, say hi to Bruce. All right, what's your favorite color? Scarlet. Scarlet. OK. <laughs> what? I love red. Come on. Yes. Very Don't, very close. yeah. Very close. All right, so blue or green? Green. Green? OK, so whenever you see a green slide come up over here, okay. you're going to read what's down there. Cool? Cool. All right. Is this other mic live? Can we make it live? If not, we're going to just have to share the mic, I guess. Like looking over to the, uh, you good? Is this one live? Hello. All right, there we go. You want to use that one? Sure. All right. Ready? This is overheard between programmers. 
What's that query? Not sure. A buck for your thoughts? Think the code hit the skids. Maybe give it a carrot? You're not too sharp, are you? <laughs> Why would you put a hat on it, on it? What's your angle here? Look, I just want to mod this code to work. Uh, me too. I, I'm amped to deliver this code. You suggesting we bang out this code? <laughs> yeah, just pound a bunch of keys. If you do that, I'm going to shriek. Just brace for the awesome, okay? What hash are you smoking? <laughs> well, I had a pretzel this morning. I had the grape strudel my parents made. <laughs> Has a little squiggle of frosting. Doesn't taste like Octothorpe. <laughs> huh? Want to ship some code? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Bruce, everyone. All right, now I'm really done. Thanks, folks. <laughs>